Hello again, I'm Matthew Gore from lightandmatter.org, and this time I'm back with my review of the Tamron 150-500mm F5-6.7 Di3 VC VXD zoom lens. In this review, I'm primarily going to be comparing the Tamron 150-500 with the Sony 200-600mm lens, because they have similar zoom ranges and the prices are not wildly different, but I'm also going to be comparing it with Sigma's older 150 to 600 mm contemporary lens, which had a reputation for very good resolution several years ago when it was released for Canon EF mount. The Tamron 150 to 500 mm lens is 8.3 inches long, making it not much longer than a 70 to 200 mm lens, which is nice, but it's actually still quite heavy. While the Sigma 150 to 600 mm lens is quite a bit longer, the Tamron is almost identical in weight, even though it's a hundred mm shorter in focal length and has a sixth of a stop less light transmission. On the other hand, Sony's 200 to 600 mm lens is more than four inches longer and weighs about a half pound more than the Tamron, and it costs about $600 more, too. Like the Sony, the Tamron is weather sealed, and it has all of the same switches. Autofocus, focus limiting, stabilization on off, and the stabilization mode. Its tripod foot is Arca Swiss compatible, but the Tamron does not have the Sony system's customizable AF lock buttons around the barrel of the lens. As always, we'll need to look at the image quality of these lenses to see which are really worth their weight in glass. But before we get to that, let's just get a quick idea of how different 500mm is from 600. Here's the moon with the Tamron 500mm lens at 100% crop. And here it is with the Sony lens at 600. It's an obvious difference, but here they are side by side. Ignore the poor resolution, the night sky is never very clear here in Seattle. Now let's take a look at something closer. Here's a little bird that was 10 or 15 feet away from me, shot with the Tamron lens at 500 millimeters. Here's the same bird with the 600 millimeter Sony lens. Here, there's still an obvious difference, but it's smaller than I would have expected, which leads me to believe that one of these lenses is giving us some focus breathing. And here is a shot in between. This heron was about 30 feet away from me, and as you can see, there's a significant difference in the size of the subject in the frame here. These are cropped to 70%. Let me bring them both into 100% as long as we're here. So that's the difference, but you'll have to decide how important that difference is to the type of photography that you do. And along those lines, maybe it's worth stopping to ask a question. If you're in the market for a lens like this, what are you going to want to use it for? I think that there are two common answers to that question, and they are shooting outdoor sports and photographing wildlife. So let's begin with those two things. For sports, since it's not football season yet, and the local baseball teams had too many COVID restrictions for me to deal with, I decided to take the Tamron and Sony lenses to shoot a Seattle Seawolves game. The Seawolves, if you're not familiar, are our professional rugby team, and the game was a new experience for me. I started shooting with the Sony. It was a hot, sunny day, so I didn't have any trouble getting fast shutter speeds with the smallish apertures of these lenses. Autofocus with the Sony was plenty fast, and the optics were nice and sharp. Most of the time, I was able to capture the action, whether it was close to me or across the field. But that's not to say it was perfect. There were also plenty of occasions where the lens just completely missed focus, or worse, where things looked good at first, but were strangely soft on closer inspection. But I was shooting with a Sony a7R III, not an A9 or an A1, which would have given me better results, and some of these instances are undoubtedly my own fault. When I switched over to the Tamron, it also did a good job of keeping up with the action. Focus was fast and silent, and it had no trouble tracking the fast-moving action, even when there were players barreling right at me. 
I actually appreciated that it was a little wider than the Sony at the near end, and the Tamron lens was very sharp. In these photos, it was at least as sharp as the Sony. No complaints there. So I got some serviceable photos, but I wouldn't say that I got any great photos with either lens. More than anything else, shooting this game was a reminder that to be a good sports photographer, you really need to know the game you're shooting so that you can anticipate the action. And I definitely did not understand what was going on half the time in this game, despite studying up on it a bit beforehand. So my poor photography here isn't a reflection on these lenses' capabilities. Of course, just like the Sony, there were plenty of shots in which I didn't manage to get focus in time, or focus was just not exactly where I wanted it. But again, much of that is probably my own fault. I will say that as a percentage, I had more in-focus shots with the Tamron lens, but I also shot more with it and had more practice at that point. When it came to shooting wildlife, Starting with the Sony again, I thought I'd try to take a few shots of stationary birds first, just to get an idea of how much reach I'd get with these lenses. And there was a very cooperative heron down on Lake Washington one evening. I shot it in a few different locations, in different lighting conditions, and I thought the results were pretty good. I was more interested in how the lenses would capture moving animals, so I was happy to see a young bald eagle coming in to do some fishing that evening. It swooped down and caught a fish, and then flew right past me before settling on a tree on the other side of the lake. I thought that I had been very lucky, but I didn't feel quite as lucky when I looked at the images at home. The first one in the sequence is sharp, but after that, this one is a little back-focused, and I missed focus on the eye in every shot after that, too. And since I hadn't gotten used to shooting at f6.3 instead of my usual f2.8, the shutter speeds here were only a thousandth of a second or so, and I didn't manage to stop all of the action, either. I should have pushed my ISO up to at least 1600. Again, the missed focus is mostly my own fault. Anyway, that was the Sony. With the Tamron, I started by going down to the Nisqually Wildlife Refuge. The weather was really hot, and the refuge was surprisingly buzzing with people, so I hardly saw any wildlife, but I saw a few random birds. I did see this heron catch a fish, which was pretty cool. Back at Lake Washington, I snapped a few little birds here and there. There's a crow. This guy hasn't had his morning coffee yet. And I photographed the same heron that I had shot with the Sony. I waited around patiently for some eagles or ospreys to go after some fish, but I didn't have any luck. One osprey flew over, and these pelicans flew by on the South Carolina coast. For me, the Tamron lens focused as quickly and reliably as the Sony. And while the level of detail was great on my A7R 3 the autofocus would have been better on an A9. But of course, telephoto lenses are good for all sorts of things beyond sports and wildlife, so I took the lenses out to do some general shooting, too. Telephotos are especially useful for making background elements bigger and more prominent in landscape photos, like the Olympic Mountains behind the ferry here. In fact, I had an idea for a photo that required a long telephoto. I wanted to shoot this little lighthouse from a distance so that Mount Rainier would tower over it in the background. So the day after the Tamron came in the mail, I hopped on a ferry out to Vashon Island to set up this shot. But there were a few problems. The first was that after I parked my car and hiked through the woods down to the beach and the lighthouse, I realized that the Tamron's lens hood had fallen off somewhere along the way, so I had to waste about 20 minutes retracing my steps and searching for it until I found it in some tall grass. And that, unfortunately, became an occasional issue with the lens hood. More importantly, the lay of the land was such that I couldn't get far enough away from the lighthouse with a clear line of view to get the compression that I was looking for. So I took one partial shot of the lighthouse, I took a few shots with another lens, 
and I headed home. So I decided to try something a little different and went out to Gasworks Park in Seattle. With the Sony lens, I caught this guy speeding around Lake Union on his little personal hydrofoil and then switched lenses to see how the Tamron would perform in the backlight, but his battery must have died and I never saw him again. Then I tried to get some shots with the city skyline pulled into the frame. These women were picnicking on a hill, and the Tamron pulls in the buildings downtown as a nice backdrop. Same idea here. Ah, and this was interesting. I saw this couple up on the hill, and at 500 millimeters, it looks like they're practically right next to the Space Needle, despite the fact that it is about two miles away. Here, it almost looks like he's jumping over the top of the Space Needle. Next, I tried to use my telephoto to simplify some compositions. Here, we just have blue, green, and a single figure walking. Here, a girl flying a kite. Very simple. So simple that it could have been just about anywhere. On the 4th of July, I was in South Carolina, and a few military aircraft flew by. And I was able to get plenty of good detail, although the light was really pretty terrible. A pair of F-16s shot past, and then this C-130 came barreling along after them. Keep in mind, I shot this picture while the airplane was flying by, not parked on a runway or something. You can just make out someone's face in the cockpit. So having shot sports and wildlife and all sorts of other various things, I was really happy with the Tamron lens overall. Focus performance was good, resolution was really good, and the stabilization was just fine too. It was still heavy to carry around, but it could have been a lot worse. Now hopefully at this point, you've all seen enough real world photos from these lenses that most of you at least are not still wondering if the Tamron will be sharp enough for you. But for those of you who need the highest resolution optics, it's still worth taking a moment to do a couple of side-by-side -side comparisons. So here we are at 200 millimeters on both lenses. Looking at the center of the frame, there's almost no difference, but the Sony has a little bit better contrast, so it looks sharper. It's a pretty negligible difference there. However, if we move up to this corner of the image, the Tamron is significantly sharper. It's pretty easy to see in the fine branches in the trees, but especially in the siding on this apartment building. Now, down in the opposite corner, there's hardly any difference again. So it looks as though the Sony has a bit of an optical flaw, maybe some decentering, that is affecting the upper right corner of this lens. I won't slog through every aperture in every part of the frame here, but at f8 in the center, they're about the same, in the upper corner, the Sony is a little improved, but still blurry. And down in the opposite corner, the Sony is sharp enough that, looking at this entrance sign, I'd say that it's slightly sharper than the Tamron, but we're splitting hairs here. Now, zooming in to about 500 millimeters, with the apertures on both lenses wide open, we get a bit of a mixed bag here in the center. On this mast, the rigging is clearly sharper on the Tamron side, but away from the center a little bit on this sign at the bottom, the text looks sharper on the Sony side. Overall, both lenses are wonderfully sharp. Being able to read this text from across Lake Union here is pretty awesome. Again, looking at the resolution up in this corner, the Tamron is dramatically better than the Sony, but if we look down in the opposite corner, they're very similar. The Sony might even be a little bit sharper in places. It's hard to tell, and again, we're splitting hairs. The same thing is true at f8, except that it appears to me that the Sony is noticeably sharper here in each instance. Even so, it's a pretty minor difference, and they're about the same beyond f8. As long as we're here, let's take a look at how this Tamron lens compares with the old Sigma 150 to 600 mm contemporary lens, with both lenses wide open at 500 millimeters, they both look great in the center of the frame, but the fine details on the Tamron side are just a little more crisp. 
Away from the center of the frame though, the Tamron is quite a bit sharper, as you can see in the trees and the hikers resting on Rattlesnake Ledge there. This time that's not an anomaly though. The Sigma is soft all around the edge of the frame compared to the Tamron. In fact, even when we stop down to F11, where the center resolution evens out, the Tamron is still quite a bit sharper at the edge of the frame. However, at the 150 mm end of the zoom, in the center of the frame, the Sigma is actually a bit sharper than the Tamron. And out at the edge of the frame, they're also very close, but the Sigma is even a little sharper here. And the Sigma stays sharper as you stop down until you reach f8, where the Tamron catches up. But of course, nobody buys these lenses to shoot at 150 millimeters. So far, I've talked a lot about the positives of this Tamron lens, but there were a couple of things that bugged me. As I mentioned earlier, I've had some trouble with the lens's hood falling off a little too easily. A hood this size is really something that needs to be locked firmly into place. The second is the push-pull clutch that's built into the zoom ring. This is a great idea in theory. If you're shooting from a tripod, you can zoom your lens to the right focal length and then slide the zoom ring forward to lock in the position so there will be no zoom creep while you're shooting. That's a good thing. The problem is that I accidentally activate the lock now and then because when I'm supporting the lens with my left hand, there isn't a whole lot to hold onto except for the zoom ring. And especially when I'm shooting something in the sky, the weight of the camera and the lens pulling downward tends to make the ring slide in the opposite direction. After my first week or two of using the lens, I got used to it and I didn't have any more problems, but depending on how often you use the lens, it might be an issue for you. So where does that leave us? The Tamron is significantly shorter and a little bit lighter than the Sony, which can be really important to some photographers. The Tamron has a good sturdy build quality. In my hand, it feels as good as the Sony, and while I like the Arca Swiss foot, I don't like the push-pull zoom lock and I wish that it had the autofocus lock buttons like the Sony. Autofocus performance in general is on par with the Sony, and image stabilization seems similar, although I've never found a good way to quantify that. Image quality is also very similar, but I think that the Sony's is just a hair better, but they're both exceptionally good optically. The Sony has better telephoto reach, and for me, that's a pretty big advantage. And when it comes to price, the Sony costs $2,000 and the Tamron costs $1,400. And $600 is a lot of money. Given all of that, would I recommend the Tamron lens? The answer is, I'm just not sure. There's no question that the Tamron is an excellent lens. It's fast and sharp and compact and well-built, and it does exactly what Tamron says it will do. The question is only whether it's the best choice among the options that exist out there for your needs as a photographer. I think that Tamron was aiming for a sweet spot between good reach and compact size, but I think that lenses on either side of that sweet spot are more compelling choices. For people who really need a lightweight telephoto lens, I'd probably recommend a 100 to 400 millimeter zoom like Sigma's, which weighs half as much as the Tamron with only 100 millimeters less reach. And I'd say shoot with APS-C. But I think that most wildlife photographers need as much reach as they can get. So as much as I appreciate Tamron's practice of cutting down size and weight in general, this is where I would rather carry the extra weight, especially when it's only a half pound of difference. But if you're the type of photographer who wants a lens in this sweet spot, then the Tamron is an excellent lens all around, and I'd happily recommend it. While I was working on this video, Sigma announced a new version of their 150 to 600 millimeter sports series lens that weighs just a couple of ounces more than this Tamron and I'll have to take a look at that lens before I decide on one for myself. Subscribe if you want to be notified when I review that lens. And that's it.